Imagine this are units. You see the damage? Why are you running? What is up guys and welcome to the Beyond Sanashi and I'm Marie Machines and today we are going to cast a replay for Battle for Middle Earth 2 The Rise of the Witch King on a beautiful map Westfold in a one-on-one -on -one situation between Isengard and the Elven Faction, good against evil, El Clasico. And also we are using the beta version for this one which is going to be called the patch 2.02 version 9.0.0 and let me tell you that much, this is going to be the biggest patch since ages with lots of changes and we're gonna hopefully be able to see some of the changes implemented into the gameplay of the players in this game. Okay, so Double Fern is opening into the Vork Pit. It's gonna be the build order from the Isengard player Solas. And his opponent is building up two Malone Trees into the Barracks, into the third Malone Tree, and the Alvin player is Mr. Smart. These are the two of the best players of the game, uh, very high skill level, and hopefully the game is going to be quite interesting and not one-sided at all. Okay, so we have Barracks opening into the Lorien Archers, and I'm assuming he's going to try to creep the Trollayer in the middle, which is going to be important for the Alvin faction because it's going to open like a... Uh, clamp potential. So the Elven faction, <laughs> you know, if I'm being honest with you, hasn't been changed. The playstyle hasn't been changed since like I am doing anything for Rise of the Witch King. In the past three years, the Elven playstyle is pretty much the same. You spam infantry, most of them being archers, and then you clamp an army and go for a big push. And what you are trying to achieve is you want to try to force an all-in fight. You know what I'm saying? That's your goal when you play elves. And Isengard, should be trying to avoid this, which you can easily do on a map like Westfold. Westfold is a gigantic map, right? We have like lots of tools to move from the bottom location, from the top location, from the middle area. Then you can even move, you know, like this, for example, you can move straight forward and like this. Like long story short, you have lots of movement opportunities and you don't have to, or you don't, you shouldn't at least, try to use only one single pathway. And that's one of the major differences between, between you know, good players and really great players you know what i'm saying good players they are kind of able to understand the game's mechanics they are, you know what they are supposed to do but most of the time they would focus on one single location and that's a bad thing you don't want to do that you will eventually be outskilled and you will you know lose because you cannot compete the map control like that in an easy way and like i said at the beginning of the game the alvin player musa smok is gonna try to creep this he will be creeping this no problemo with the pikeman they're gonna also get almost level two and the money will also be secured by the Alvin player Smokey. Very good. But the war packs, you see the new whole, whole animation. Um, they added this also to this beta version, which hopefully will be released very soon. And a big new, by the way, guys, you know, they are actually able to, you know, fix the inbuilt delay from Give Me to the Rise of the Witch King. So that's nothing crazy as a new for the for the offline players for the casual players who are playing against bots but if you are an online player that's a huge thing because as you guys know or you at least heard of it the off host or the on host advantage in this bbf me games is a huge deal so the player who is hosting the game will have a huge advantage over his opponent because his units will react instantly while the off host player will have always like a delay you know like order delay when you heal it will be coming through after like 3-4 seconds, which can be game changing in most situations. So long story short, if two players equally skill leveled are fighting against each other and the one is host and the other one is off host, the chances that the host player is gonna win are at least 10% higher, even though they are like 50-50, you know what I'm saying? And they are able to fix that, which is a huge success. And I'm looking forward for the release of the patch, which hopefully will be this year in 2022 but I don't know yet when it's going to be exactly, but the second it's going to be updated, I will of course keep you guys also updated. Okay, the first big push is coming now with Lorien Archers, Lorien Warriors, uh, Miflons, and one more Lorien Archer, two Archers, one Sportman, one Pikeman, and let's see if Isengard got what it takes to defend such a force. We have Rylan Call available for the, for the Alvin player, Mr. Smok, he's sitting currently on 500 command points in total, his opponent is sitting on 400 command points, he's up to 2 power points after the war chant, which is unfortunately for him on cooldown. But guess what? They also changed the buff and debuff system of the game completely. So the buffs are not very strong anymore. They are still strong, don't get me wrong, but they are not that strong anymore. Earlier in Rise of the Witch King, the person with the buff advantage would have a, you know, pretty much like a huge advantage. It would be like an auto win. You would automatically win and dominate the fights because you would get 50% damage and 50% armor. 
and now the damage gain and also the armor gain have been reduced. So it's still a very strong buff, but it's just not 50% anymore, which is crazy because you have basically 50% damage reduction. It's not only about the damage you deal, but also the tankiness you will get from it was kind of insane combination, you know what I'm saying? And they also nerfed the debuff, which is not going to be able to nullify leadership bonuses anymore. And also the leadership got nerfed. So basically, less leadership, less buff, but more fighting, more spam, and hopefully also more hero action, because guess what? They also changed the amount of money you get from the resource buildings. So you can gather money now way faster, which hopefully will make more space for the for the hero gameplay, which was always missing in my opinion in the Rise of the Witch King. Out of all BFME games, Rise of the Witch King was the only game with only unit spam. You have barely seen heroes in tournaments and hopefully that's going to be changed for the upcoming tournaments in the most recent version of the patch 2.02. Okay, so Isengard player was able to defend himself, no problemo. He has also Kribane now. Unfortunately, the descriptions are not updated yet because they are still using the beta version. I mean, the final version is not out yet. Otherwise, it would be released, but it's not. Um, on the other side, we have Alvin player is up to 550 command points. He has a stable and two barracks, but both of them are going to be level 1. That means no uh, midwood guardians of the paths anytime soon. Oh, that's gonna hurt. If you lose the level 2 furnace, that's minus 75 command points in the bank. We will defend the elven land. Okay. The level 2 are also way tankier. They have a bit more HP. But you can see they have also less HP now. You know what I'm saying? Okay. I mean, that's not a good thing though, because he actually lost it. And once again, you know, losing the level 2 furnaces will deny them from getting to level 3 anytime soon. Level 3 for the resource building is actually a huge power spike for any faction because the second you are building, regardless if it's a resource building like a furnace or a production building like a Uruk pit, gets level 3, they will not only become way tankier in compared to level 1 or level 2, but also they will get the chance to shoot. It means one single Lorian warrior, for example, couldn't manage to destroy a level 3 furnace anymore because the furnace would be able to defend himself. So more durability, more defense and also more resources like a win-win-win situation. That's why it's so incredibly important to keep your resource buildings protected especially when they are level 2. Okay, Isengard is forcing the Elven player to retreat but I think it's like a tactical retreat now. He doesn't really need to give up too much. He will lose eventually one or two you know, Malone trees but he should be in a good spot. The statue is coming up for leadership, and that's the smart move, I think. That's what you are supposed to do. You want to split up your army like he does, you know, crush this Malone tree, this one at the same time at the bottom side, and then kind of fight a little bit in the middle of the map. And I think what they did, also to the debuff, to the Kribane from the Isengard faction and the, you know, cave pets from the Goblin faction, they made them unkillable. It was a problem, you know, when you wouldn't pay attention and you would use your debuff a bit too early, they would literally get one-shotted by the enemy archers. It would kind of hurt you because it's a 5 power point investment blown away with no result. And that's changed. Now the debuff is weaker, but your Keef pets or Kribin in most cases are going to be indestructible and killable. Okay, so 6... 100 command points for Elves and 625 for Isengard. It's pretty even right now. We will have to see a transition into the Warp Pit level 2 though. We need some sort of trample. Um, the point of the Warp Packs is they are good early game units, but they fall off big time and they are also not great fighters. You know what I'm saying? That's the problem with them. They cannot trample like the Warp Riders can. And they pretty much lose against any other unit in a one-on-one -on -one situation. Their, their strength lies in the mobility part. They can buff themselves with the whole ability, and then you need to kind of move around with them, discover the map a little bit, and try to deal economical damage by taking down the enemy Malon trees. That's all you can do with them. But now we have the Linden Horse Archers, which are the best horse archers in the game. I mean, there are three different ones, but this one is unique because this one is exclusively a horse archer, while Spider Riders from the Goblin faction can shoot both and also use Sword. And same goes also to the Rohirrim from the Man of the West faction. But Lindens, they can only shoot, but they are the best horse shooters. And in the very late game, if you manage to get to the point in which you can eventually purchase the Silverton Arrows from your armory with the Alvin faction and you upgrade them on your Lindens, holy quackamole, you know? 
then you have a mobility of a Rohirrim and you are hitting like a like a Mirkwood, pretty much. It's very, very strong. Sharku is one of the best counters to the Alvin faction, even though Sharku got nerfed multiple times in the previous patch versions, but he is still quite beefy and tanky against archers, and he has splash damage too. And also at the same time he's quite um, good against cavalry. As you can see, you can one-shot them. So Sharku should never have time to level up, you know. In level 7 is a massive power spike to Manita, can give you such an incredible sustain and tankiness. You get 100% more armor when you use Manita, and you basically kill up to full HP. So even when you have like 1 HP left, you eat one of the enemy units and boom, you are like full HP and you have 100% armor. Oh, Fiesta. Oh, that's a... I mean, he has too many pikemen, dude. To be honest, I don't know... I don't know about that. <laughs> I don't know why you have this many pikemen on the field. Like, I think it's a little bit too much. Like, he has not that many cavalry units on the field. He has, like, two battalions, maybe three max, but... I don't think it's needed to invest that much money and command points into the pikemen. Okay. We have also Mirkwoods on the field, boys, the best archers in the game, they are shooting and hitting like a truck from downtown. You can also use the Alvin Cloak to get invisible. And Sharku is doing what he's supposed to do, right? He's chasing down and hunting down those Lancers from the Alvin player Mr. Smog, trying to harass the furnaces, but he won't let him. This army is very strong. So um, in an infantry versus infantry battle, you cannot win unless you have an advantage with your buff advantage or you have debuff available, for example, or you have leadership from Lourdes. But Lourdes hasn't even been recruited. Earlier, a couple of seconds ago, we have seen the Devastation spell being used, which gives you a great chunk of money. But we will need Lourdes, and Lourdes has to be level 5. Because as you can see, there is Haldir on the field. And even though he is level 1 right now, Haldir is one of the few heroes in the game who can level up with no problems, right? I mean, he can level up from level 1 to level 5 in like one single fight. If you place him next to the archers, it can be even done way faster. And it's a huge power spike. Because remember, the, the debuff from the Kribin got reduced. So basically, you cannot nullify enemy leadership bonuses anymore. Which is kind of like a nerf to the goblins and to the Isengard faction. Uh, and it will make this matchup eventually a bit harder. Okay, um, the, the weakness of the Alvin faction, there are two weaknesses. One of them is being the lack of siege damage. So basically, if you want to finish off your opponent, if you want to take down the building successfully uh, and fast, you need to get siege weapons, aka your ends from your end mood. That's very important. And the second weakness is the lack of money. So in late game, when the command points are looking similar, there is no chance in which the Alvin eco can keep up with the Isengard eco. Isengard has the strongest eco hands down in the game, you know what I'm saying? and can low-key low match with any other faction in terms of production and spam. Even though your units are way more expensive. But it, it doesn't mean that you can win fights. With this army, you can win even unfavorable fights. Like, you have too many Mirkwoods now, 3 battalion of Mirkwoods, holy, you know. This is gonna be kinda, kinda tough to defend, dude, you know what I'm saying? 3 Mirkwoods, lots of Lorien Arches, Pikemen to protect them, and eventually Haldir joining the battlefield too. Uh oh Okay. I mean, the builder... Uh oh 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 <laughs> Not even... Uh oh poor builder. Yeah, but, but dude, he couldn't get out. That hurts, dude. Like, builders are so valuable in this game. They cost you every single time 500 resources. You know, that's a lot of cash, especially early game, but it, even in the mid to late game, you lose such a big momentum. And you have like only one builder. That's a huge clam, by the way, guys. He needs Warc Riders or Sharku in this area. But Sharku and his Warc Riders are actually being used for the map control fights. They were able to destroy this level 2, Malone 3, around this area. And if you take a look into the current command points, we can see that Mrs. Mock is almost at 1000. He has a crazy amount of resource income. He has an end mood now. He has statues, which are also giving you fear resistance, additional damage, and armor leadership. And on top of that, they give you also command points. So basically, you can even increase your command points by just building statues, you know? Um, I think what Isengard needs is either Saruman or you need Lourdes. You need leadership. You need upgrades. You need a lot of stuff if you want to be able to win against this fight. 
I mean, I, I like the investment of the siege weapons, but the siege weapons are actually a great counter to the elven infantry spam because they can outrange any archer and they're also being tanky against archers. As you can see, the archers are shooting them down all the time, but they are barely dealing any damage and the ballista can successfully knock down the enemy units all the time on the ground. Um, but again, this is not the best siege weapon in the game when it comes to deal with units. For example, a trebuchet from the main faction with the firestone upgrade or catapult with the firestone from the dwarven faction, mortar catapults, uh, basically everything besides giants from the goblins and also the ballista from the Isengard faction can actually be good when it comes to deal with the units. But it's enough, you know, for now. And Isengard will have devastation once again very soon. His command points kept, so he will unwillingly have to save money. He cannot invest the money into anything because he cannot recruit more units at this point of the game. And you, you will have to save money, right, at this point. But you don't want to lose your ballista like that. You want to move on, don't feed them. They are very expensive units. And I think the, the, the saved money can eventually be invested into something like Saruman. Could be a very great investment, you know. Saruman is actually quite tanky against archers. He doesn't die too fast. And maybe you will get the chance to get into a beautiful situation in which you can wipe out the entire enemy lines with your wizard blast. And the second you get Saruman level 2, you will become, you know, in my opinion, a much better and more reliable hero than Gandalf will be because Fireball has like a really long range and you can rotate it all the time. So whenever your Fireball is available, you can use it. You get free XP. Your opponent cannot even shoot you back. It deals hella damage, it has like crazy range and it can't be missed. It's like a point and click, right? And then you can use that over and over again to get more experience to level 6 in which you un un unlock your Thunderbolt, which is also ranged. So Thunderbolt, long range, Fireball, crazy range. And even if you don't get the chance to get into the melee range for a Wizard Blast, you can still rotate between Fireball and Thunderbolt over and over again. And both of them have like crazy splash damages, you know, splash area. And you can eventually wipe out the entire enemy army if you're Saruman, you know, all alone. Oh, that's a bad move from Isengard. He's literally inting his Ballista now for no reason. Oh, that's bad. <laughs> that's really bad, actually. He lost three Ballista. Yikes. That's tough because it's a level 2 Siege Warriors requirement for them to recruit. And they cost 500 each. So he lost, like, basically 1,500 resources without achieving anything with them. And we have Tribute on his way. The last match of the Ents will begin very soon. If we have almost 15 power points for Smoking, that means we will have the Alvin, uh, the Eagle Alliance special summon from the Spellbook. And there is not too much that can shoot him down. I'm actually surprised that Isengard never ever wanted to recruit Lourdes. I think he had money all the time. And heroes are a great investment into the mid to late game later on. But the problem... Oh, hold on a second. Hey, hey, he actually went for the Lightning Strike, boys. Guys, I don't want to miss that. He went for the, for the tower upgrade on the fortress and the Orphank and now he has the chance to go for lightning. He went for it. Oh yeah, he wanna... Oh, he killed the end. <laughs> okay, now Haldir is getting bullied a little bit but I think he should be tanky. Oh my! Actually, hold on a second dude, that's crazy damages. And the Eagle Summon will be used defensively to deal with the enemy forces. Um, he will still be able to destroy one or two Malone trees, but it's not a big deal. The Eagles should be able to deal with the rest, no problem. Wildman of Dunland. I mean, it's not the end of the world for Isengard because he's, you know, pretty much traded a Wildman of Dunland Summon for the Eagle Summon. And the Eagles are much more valuable because they cost 15 power points and Wildman only cost, you know, 10 power points. We have Glorfindel on the field, and Lourdes is finally here, but that's the problem with Lourdes, because he's level 1 only now. He cannot even threaten those uh, Alvin heroes. When he would be level 4 or 5, at least level 4, you have Cripple. You can shut him down completely, but level 1... Oof, I don't know about that, you know? We will see. I mean, he went for the industry too, like, this is giving you money, this is giving you money. This basically gives you also money, because they have the pillage. And the Ballista is going to be taken down right before the Eagles. Gotta leave the Middle Earth. And the harassment is happening. Oh, beautiful rallying call. Level, oh, that's, that's huge, by the way. Destroying this is massive because it has industry on it. You see, the glowing. That's gonna hurt. He just used it too, like a few seconds ago. Okay, the Isengard player is kind of in a, in, a, in a jail situation, boys. He's kind of in a really bad spot. 
He's only at 525 command points, the elves are up to 925. Even though Isengard was able to invest the power points into the Vestition for money, into industry for money, but he's just, you know, too low on command points. It means even if he would have money, which he doesn't, he couldn't get the same amount of units on the field like his opponent does because he has way lower command points. And I've said already many, many times, in a, in a clash between infantry against infantry, nothing beats the elven enemy, <laughs> elven archers. That's not possible. The Mirkwoods are gonna slaughter every other unit in the game. Uh, in a, in you know, long terms, it's gonna be a lock, like a long fight. And, you know, he can even use Mist to make them height and debuff your units, make them weaker. And he has leadership too. And you don't. So, long story short, the extrovers are meant to be countered to archers, but I don't think they will ever get the chance to get into the range because extrovers, in compared to archers, have way lower range. Three beard is on the field. Boom. <laughs> A wizard for pay. It's always satisfying to see three beard against Isengard. You know, just like in the films when he was sieging the the orphan and the Isengard. Look. They are tanky, you know, the, the, the three bit is so tanky against ballistas too. So you you need eventually well, like one hour to kill him. Look how many, like three shots. I think he at bare minimum took like six shots of ballistas on his face and lost barely a quarter of his HP. Nine shots it take, took to get him to 50% HP, but it's a hero unit. So the second he goes back, he can easily regenerate all his HP back to full HP in like few seconds. So you don't want to trade with him like that. You want to either kill him because don't hurt what you can't kill, you know? Okay, the Malontri has been taken down. It's gonna be like a siege war situation. Or oh, we have even Silverton. Oh my god. You see, they are countering the Slorian Arches, by the way. But Silverton Arrow is like a cheat situation, dude. Good luck dealing with that, you know? Look at this. Like, this laser shots, like pew, 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 pew. It's just the best upgrade against units. Level 3 buildings here, level 3. Barracks, Ain't Mood, Well, Statue, we have uh, Lancers on the field for the for the structural damage, we have three beards recovering over time, like I said before, he's almost full HP once again, and we have plenty of Arches, including Mirkwoods, with Silverton Arrows, Oh, I, I don't think you can match this, I don't think you, you can match this anymore, that's not possible, 13 power points, he needs like a little bit more for the Watcher, Watcher could eventually buy you the time you need, a beautiful watcher underneath of this army could actually be quite juicy, but I don't think it would be game changing. It would eventually buy you some time, but I don't think Isengard is in a position in which the counter attack would cause the amount of damage he needs to get back into the scheme. Lourdes wasn't even able to get level 2 yet. He's trying to deal economical damage, he's trying secretly to get the power points collected he needs, because in reality, he cannot fight against his army of elves. That's not possible. So he needs to find another way to fight against them without having to fight against them. If this makes sense for you guys. Like, not fight with your army because your army is gonna get slaughtered. So you wanna find ways to kinda defend yourself without having to sacrifice all your army, which would be anyway pointless. He has even the elven armor purchase on his lances, they are becoming quite tanky, no pikemen anywhere close, and the economy from Isengard is gonna drop down farther and farther and farther. The Vestation has been used, doesn't hurt 3 beards. 3 beard is like a boss. Super tanky by the way, surprisingly tanky in my opinion. I mean he's a hero at the end of the day, but still, like he is the best and the tankiest siege weapon in the game. Only fire can hurt him, literally. Oh, the Watcher in the water. Yeah, he wiped out a lot of the enemy units. Uh, almost all the archers got one-shotted from the Watcher. Watcher has like a crazy damage output, right? So it basically has almost the same damage output like I would say Balrog or, or I don't know, like EOD. From the summon point, everything above this Watcher is getting knocked back and this has like crazy burst damage. Level 3 Furnace is getting damaged a lot. Lourdes throwing the sword, using the Carnage, trying to get experience. Uh, Hydra is gonna get in safety, no problemo. And I think Smokey could have been a bit more, um, uh, you know, on point with the heroes, in my opinion. Like, you don't, it doesn't really need a lot of micro. All you gotta do is place your Hydra in between your arches and that's it. You, you wanna keep him together with the arches to share experience. So, there are two different ways of getting experience in this game. Either you need to fight with the hero and kill stuff, or you need to just stay close to another unit that kills stuff for you, and you can share the experience with him. 
which is the best way to level up your heroes. Especially archer heroes should be no problem to level up to like even level 10 in a few minutes, in a few battles. Okay, Sharko level 7, many it is available. Isengard is holding himself, but it took him the Watcher. So the Eagles are almost back up, but on top of that, the Elven player, Smokey was also able to collect 20 power points and even more than that. So he is like 4 power points away from his 25, and Isengard is far away because Isengard went for the 10 power point Wildman, 10 power point Devastation, 10 power point Industry. So he, inv he invested 20 power points into his 10 power points. If he wouldn't have done that, if he would just go for the 10, 15 and 25 right after, he would have gotten the chance to go for the dragon by now. The two options for the Isengard faction in the lead game from the 25 power points are either the dragon strike, which in my opinion is like the worst 25 by in the game, or you have the best 25 in the game, which is a summon dragon. Summon dragon, <laughs> holy moly. Like, I'm telling you, summon dragon here on the spot. You can kill the end mood, all this you know small buildings the malone 3 level 3 the varax level 3 and this varax in like two shots you place a dragon here right here you attack this malone 3 the corner damage will hit everything behind everything next to it so you can literally deal oh my hold on a second three bit got roasted by the <laughs> oh oh my goodness you remember the scene you know when when saruman was on, on top of the orphan and was like Lum, 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 you know, <laughs> that's exactly what happened to Tribute, my man. I think he couldn't use it in, in during the defense of uh, the problem. I think if Saruman would have been able to see that coming, and that's kind of like a weird situation, right? In the, in the films, he was using the Palantir, so he was actually kind of aware of what's gonna happen in the future a little bit. I mean, he had like, he had like no far sight to see in the future, but I think he would still be a little bit aware. I was very surprised that Saruman was so surprised about the fact that he's getting crushed by the ants. Because let's be real, if you would have expected it, if you would have known it, you know, that this is gonna... Oh my! Sorry, <laughs> I was actually too deep again in the films. We missed the flood. If you would have known that the ants and Treebeard are gonna attack the Orphan, the Isengard, I think he would have just let a couple of the units he sent to Helm's Deep in Isengard, and they should have been able to defend the ants. No problem, I think. I mean, ants are very powerful, but I think... And not immortals. So we have seen even in the films, even unprepared, Isengard was still able to take down a couple of them down. And if they would be prepared, I think Tribit would have not a stand a chance. Oh, he has even fire arrows on the fortress towers, you can see. And also very important, it makes also your ballista very strong. You know, the ballista is gonna sh add now fire damage to it, and it will deal way more damage to the ants. But I think uh, we won't get the chance to see that. Because Isengard is getting literally smoked, and I think, just like in the films, you know, the good will always rule the evils. No, the crossbowman level 5. Hello, darkness, my old friend. The eagles. <laughs> I'm like Peregrine took now. The eagles. The eagles are coming. Oh, finish off the level 3, man. That's 100 command points, by the way. If you lose that, you lose 100 command points. Boom, you see 500 dropping down to 400, just like that. Level almost 5, Glorfindel, one of the best fighters in the game with the Blade of Purity. He can almost 1v1 against everyone. And Glorfindel is one of the heroes who has been nerfed multiple times. Like, I believe I made a switch to Rise of the Witch King back in the day in version 7.0. It was like, I would say in, in early 20, 2018, like it's over 4 years by now, right? And... um. Back in the day, since today, I think this guy got nerfed like five times. His damage, tankiness, his abilities got nerfed. I don't know, like, you cannot use Wind Rider and Blade of Purity anymore because in order to use Blade of Purity, you need to be dismounted now. Like, lots of stuff to make him weaker. <laughs> but he's still very strong, you know what I'm saying? Lords, level 5, can cripple. Oh, he crippled Haldir. I cannot believe it. Everybody is highly leveled, but Hydir is just getting level 5. You see, Blade of Purity is still so tanky. Lords throwing the sword, using Carnage, and showing the elf what the Uruks are made of. Uruks are actually literally orcs. <laughs> and the white men have done it. And you know what? The orcs are apparently made by el of elves, right? So elves got tortured, and then they kind of turned into the orc warriors. It kind of makes no sense, though, because at the end of the day, orcs are so much weaker than elves. So much weaker. 
but Uruks are not, you know, Uruks are different. They are like, you know, the new generation orcs. The orcs you don't want to mess with. Dude, uh, I'm not, I don't know, man. I want to actually watch the Lord of the Rings series on, on Amazon Prime. I know many, many people are pessimistic about it. They have, like, their doubts, which I can understand why. And I think we are too pessimistic. We judge stuff without seeing the actual content, you understand? We don't know how it's gonna be. We have seen not much. We have seen a couple of trailers and teasers, but that's pretty much it. We have not seen a single episode yet, and I think the negativity is a bad thing. And also a good thing at the same time, because when you are too negative about it, that the chance that you get disappointed afterwards is gonna be also extremely low. But even now, you know, I'm happy that they are making something Lord of the Rings related. And in the best case scenario, it might actually get some traffic to the Lord of the Rings video games, aka Battle for Middle Earth games. And in the best, best, best case scenario, it might actually be like a wake up call for the developers, for the developing co companies like EA Games, for example, or any other game re developer, developing company. And maybe, but only maybe, there might be a chance in a future in which we eventually can get a lot of the rings, the Battle for Middle Earth 3 official game release. Can you imagine that? It would be like the best case scenario. A RTS game made by actual companies based on the Lord of the Rings, the Battle for Middle Earth games. With now's 2022's graphics, animations. And then you can even add all the heroes from the from the series, you know what I'm saying? Like you can make like a third and second age combined, for example. Okay, Dragon Strike is available for Isengard. We are looking for a chance to see a juicy one, but I, I want to see, oh, actually, maybe I'm wrong with this Dragon Strike. I mean, I think it's okay against buildings, but it's actually horrible against units because the thing about the Dragon Strike, I will show you. You, you see the animation coming, right? You see the dragon coming from outside of the map. So if you have eyes in your head, then you should be able to dodge the incoming damage because look what's happening. The dragon is coming. Imagine this is your units. Actually, it's not bad. I mean, it's not as good as a, as a, as a summon dragon. But he still wiped out everything. Okay, dude, I take it back. Dragon, you are the good man. Look at him. He almost died <laughs> to whatever. The problem is... And that's the that's the annoying part of the elf infection in late game. When you, for example, play Mordor against elves. And you get to the point in which you can finally summon your Balrog. The Silverton arrows, they are dealing crazy amount of damage to Balrog too. Oh my blah 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 blah. He missed the ends though, unfortunately. Ends are what you are trying to get to. Um the Ballista should be trying to attack this. You see the damage? The fire fire shot? The Ballista? Did you guys see that? He, the end is burning now. He's gonna die to the to the burn. Yeah, I'm telling you. When you go for the upgrade on the fortress, you make your ballista hit like a f with like fire damage, pretty much, and it just like one shots the ends at this point. You see? But he has barely any units on the field. Lords against Glorfindel, the epic showdown. Who is gonna be the better warrior? Who is the better swordman? Who is the better swordman? Why are you running? Why are you running? Blade of purity. <laughs> Lords is like. Looks like meets me, looks like Elven Flash is back on the menu, boys. Level seven, the one true warrior, and that's one of the reasons. Lourdes is one of the reasons why Isengard is the one faction with the least heroes. Mordor is more than Isengard. Goblins have even more than Isengard. Man, so man, anyway, you know, man has like the most heroes in the game, but Isengard has only four heroes, boys. Sharku, Lourdes, Saruman, and the most important one. Wormtongue, Grima. That's it. Actually, like, how much, how many Engmar has? Engmar has Waldor, um, Rogash, and Witch King. And Karsh. So Engmar has also four, right? Oh, the Watcher. Boom, son. Elves have way more. I don't need to count that one. I think Goblins have, but Azok, Gorkil the Goblin King, Dragonlord, and Shelob. Ah, okay. Goblins have also four. Dwarves have also four. <laughs> Actually, so many factions have only four heroes. Dwarves have King Dean, King Brain, Gloin, and Gimli. 
look this shot. The burn animation is so funny from them. The eagle. This one is from the from the fortress too, but he's gonna die now to the to the towers. Or he's fast though. Shoot him, Lords. Lords MVP already. Okay. They are preparing for a big push. The Nolders, they are actually badly damaged. They are only level 1. They are the elite units and elite warriors from the Elven Barracks level 3. But he lost the Elven Barracks level 3 long time ago to the, to the Dragon Strike. Uh, we will have flat very soon for the second time. We missed the first one, unfortunately. In the end, they cannot really approach this area. That's, that's the problem. The fire shotting Ballista, they are hitting like an absolute track. But, you know, a look into the minimap can tell you and give you the information about the current stage of the game, right? I mean, basically, elves are dominating. He has even... Look at this fabulous person. He has even this dude on the field. Tranduil, the daddy of Legolas. And he's so cool, by the way, in, in Beef Me 2, because in Beef Me 2, he can get on his elk. You know, on his elk, like in the films, but here in Rise of the Witch King, he can't. He's only like a bowman here. Um, I mean, he's also bowman in Beef Me too, but he can shoot from his elk too. He's pretty much like a horse archer, pretty much. You know, mobile, also very strong with the dead eye, ton of vengeance. By the way, this is, I believe, one of the most powerful single target abilities in the game, if not the most powerful one. Against heroes, it chunks them. Um, but there are a lot of them, actually. Yeah, the, the thing is, I mean, there is so much potential about the heroes in Rise of the Witch King, but like I said multiple times, we don't get the chance to see them very often. That's the problem with them, you know what I'm saying? Like, for example, the Blink from Karsh. So Karsh is like an ability which also deals crazy amount of single target ability, uh, single target damage, you know what I'm saying? Also, Mouth of Sauron, the evil eye, chunks. Like, I have seen already one single time that Kar uh, that Mouth of Sauron with the evil eye was killing a Drogov, one of the most expensive heroes in the entire game for 5,000 resources, from 90% HP to 0 HP with one single shot, one tapping him. Like, there are so many heroes with potentials and great abilities, but because the game is developing into a spam fiesta, we don't get the chance to see them. Like, for example, it's a really long game, but we have not seen a Saruman at all. Not even Warm Tongue has been seen. The Eagles are meant for the second or third time. At 1000 command points versus 425, Isengard is fighting until the very end, but the end is near. Trust me on that one, the end is really, really near. We have upgraded units. And he is in a prison situation. He cannot leave this area. He cannot go forward because there are units. He cannot go to downside. There are buildings. He cannot go to the top side. There are also units. He has like a builder and a <laughs> single lookout tower around the situation, but uh, around this area. But that's pretty much it. That's all he got. He has Sharku, Lords, the two heroes to rule them all. The problem here for the Alban faction is. And again, I kept saying that I keep saying that because it's very very true, you know. Elves are horrible against campers. So if you camp against elves, you can actually stall the game out for a long time. If this wouldn't be elves, but it would be like dwarves or men or any other faction really, this Eisenhower would have been defeated by now, trust me, you know. But their siege is so weak with the ends. Because and also with the units. For example, dwarves, they don't need siege weapons. They can literally go ham with the guardians and siege hammers and mithril meal. They are quite tanky. They can tank every damage and take down your fortress in like four seconds. And men can do that with Drohirim, for example. And heroes like Elma giving them leadership. But elves, they have like no leadership on, on foot, on horse heroes. And their horses, the Rivendell Lancers, are also not very strong. When it comes to deal damage and also not very tanky. They are like light cavalry. They are very squishy units actually, even with the heavy armor. Okay, so we have almost 12 power points. I think at this point he's just waiting for the flat cooldown. And I think he wanna just commit with the flat, use flat and commit fully. And with the flat you can kill all the expansions around the fortress. You can damage everything around the fortress too. So if you aim it like this for example, you can kill the siege forks. The flat is coming boys. He's gonna use far side to get vision. He wanna use the perfect angle to actually deal as much damage as potentially possible with the flat. He's gonna go for the game winning moment now. But again, the, the Thunderbolt or the Lightning Strike is gonna be available once again. Boom, it's a great chunk. It doesn't deal too much damage to the fortress, but it chunked the fortress. And Isengard, does he have money? He doesn't have that much money actually, he can only build one of them. One of the Ballista expansion, Treebeard can now siege, but he's gonna use it. Let's see. Boom, boom, boom. Hot, 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 hot. That's what could happen in the films if Saruman would have actually been able to use his ability. Look at this dude, that looks so amazing, man. 
The, the fortresses in, in this game have such a crazy ability. Think about Engmar. You can shoot like a gigantic snowball on your enemy units. You know what I'm saying? Mordor can do, shoot pretty much the same thing, but in fl in fire, in flame shot. And Isengard is like the Thunderbolt. Dwarves have like this mighty launch catapult. You know what I'm saying? Goblins can get like a gigantic fire drake on the field. Elves can recruit an eagle who can stay there for permanent and has even abilities, you know? And then you have a man of the best faction who can reveal the map. That's it. <laughs> GG well played. Solas has been defeated. Mrs. Mock, the Alvin player, will be victorious in this game. I hope you guys enjoyed this one. If you did, please don't forget to leave a like and also subscribe for more videos like this in the future. I will see you next time. Until then, keep hitting like a track. And as always, stay beyond standards. Peace out, boys.